Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode two of Inside Data. Um, we'll be tying in other interviews uh, alongside our Meet the Author specials. And on today's episode, uh, we'll be talking about the role data plays in sustainability. I'm joined by Phil Copperwheat from Morgan Sindel Property Services. Phil, um, thank you for being here today. Um, would you like to tell our audience a, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Phil Copperwheat. I'm the Information Systems Director here at Morgan Sindel. I've got responsibility for the Property Services Division. And Morgan Sindel is a UK-based construction and regeneration uh, organisation. Right, fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we all know, or well, maybe we all should know, that the UK set a target to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Uh, Phil, what is Morgan Sindel's position on its own corporate responsibility for reaching net zero by 2030? So I think one of the things to look at is the, the built environment in the, in the UK accounts. I think it's for about 40% of our carbon emissions, and that includes uh, energy usage. So as a construction and regeneration organisation, it, it's kind of at the heart of what we're actually trying to do in both the projects that we deliver and also the activities uh, um, inside of the organisation. So since 2010, we've had a 65% think, reduction in our carbon emissions. Wow. Um, we have a, a calculation which is around our carbon intensity, which is where you look at the amount of carbon emitted against uh, per million pounds of revenue. So that's been cut by over 75% uh, in the same period. Um, and there's some other stuff as well that we've done, which is uh, about being independently recognised uh, by organisations such as CDP, which formerly was the Carbon Disclosure Project, where they've kind of given us a score of A for both leadership in climate change and also uh, the way that we're engaging with our supply chain, which is a critical part of what most businesses need to kind of then consider inside of that. Um, yeah. We're also one of the first to, again, science-based targets uh, initiative. Um, we've been having our carbon emissions uh, independently audited now for uh, the last 10 years. So it's quite at the heart of what we do as, as a business. And I think some of the things that we're going to talk to in this also show about how we're trying then to use technology and support the wider sector in how we can deliver on the commitments that we have as a, as a community as a, and as a country, and I guess in some ways as the planet. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's just a notorious industry for, for none of those things, really. So I'm quite looking forward to finding out a bit more, uh, a bit more about it. Um, you, uh, you, you retained us to build a specialist data team specifically for um, what's known as um, the GoldenEye product. Can you explain what GoldenEye is and does and how this business fits into the wider Morgan Sindel family? Yeah, so GoldenEye is a cloud-based platform for accessing uh, insights around the health of domestic homes and commercial workplace. Um, so at its heart is uh, an ecosystem of IoT sensors that are providing us uh, real data from, from homes, from commercial properties on, how, on their overall health. So it's not about trying to be like smart homes and you know, smart lights and stuff like that. It's about understanding the, the fabric of the buildings and how energy efficient they are, um, what the air quality may be inside of those, and bringing that information back, looking for issues or problems, but also then modeling that data to, to understand trends uh, and identify things that we need to do. So it's kind of trying to get into that world of being you know, predictive around things and, uh, and providing data to allow people to make better decisions, whether that's me or you in our homes about making them more efficient and effective or from landlords or occupiers of, of buildings right right brilliant so what what's the impact of the data and insights that you you provide how do or will they play out as real world sort of mitigators of, of environmental damage so if you're looking kind of from a home point of view we're monitoring to look at what the energy efficiency is of appliances. So domestically, so me and you probably have a, uh, today we probably have a natural gas boiler uh, in our homes. We're looking at what the efficiency of that is, how much it's costing to actually then raise the temperature in a house by, by one degree, and also how, how long it's taking for a house to lose that degree in temperature. 
Um, we're then looking at the information around like EPC certificates to see what recommendations are made. And then through the wider Morgan Sindel business, we might be engaged to actually then implement uh, planned works to remediate homes to uh, add more insulation. And then we're looking to constantly then review how that energy usage is being affected by those changes. And also trying to make sure that there's no unintended consequences. So for example, the more insulation that you put in your home, if you're not also looking at uh, uh, how air is circulating, you can actually introduce damper mold problems into a home, which is a, a whole secondary issue. But it's all about how we use that data to understand kind of where we are and then predict things that we need to do and then measure them to make sure that we actually get them. And that same principle then plays out inside of a commercial workspace where we're looking at the, the HVAC that may be running inside of there, how efficient is that, how that business is then interacting with its building and using it, and are they using it in the most efficient and effective way? Yeah, that's incredible. So who, who, who are your customers pri primarily, and how is this impacting us as members of the general public? So from a property point of view, we tend to work with you know, what I consider big landlords in terms of local authorities and uh, housing associations. Um, who some of our clients are looking after 15, 20,000 uh, homes. So from a domestic point of view, they're kind of one of our target markets and also where some of, some of the most vulnerable in our society are kind of then living. From, um, from an office point of view, at the moment we're deploying out for our Morgan Tyndall offices, which kind of comes back to our own net zero ambitions about monitoring uh, the usage. And then there are other avenues inside the Morgan Tyndall group from Overbury, who are one of the UK's, or is the UK's leading fit-out organisation, who are working with all uh, companies on, on how to actually redesign office spaces, which is most prevalent in a, in a post-COVID world. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, so hopefully we're going to hear a bit more about this from COP26, the, uh, the UN's climate change conference, which is actually hosted in Glasgow uh, at the end of October uh, this year. But data is uh, critical to the process of finding a solution to reaching net zero targets. Um, so data is one thing, but then we also have the, the people element to it. Um, what advice can you provide other businesses on creating positive engagement within teams? Uh, how have you created this sense of purpose within GoldenEye and, and the wider, wider sort of Morgan Sindel group? So I think one of the key things is if you can measure it, you can do something about it. So that's kind of what at the heart of well, a lot of the things that Morgan Sindel is doing and also some of the, the new products that we're, we're bringing to market around things like GoldenEye. But then the next key thing is how do you use that information and how do you enable people to then to make changes in behaviour off of that data? Otherwise, if you're not careful, you'll get data for data sake and people will be inundated with data. But if it doesn't, if you, if you can't actually structure it in a way that it can allow people to make decisions, then it becomes ineffective inside of that. And we know from the sectors that we work in, we can't invest or insulate our way out of this. People have to fundamentally change behaviours. We have to change the way that we use, uh, use energy inside of our homes and, and understand that some of the new technologies that come in, maybe heat pumps, don't operate in the same way as our gas boiler and our, our toasty hot warm radiators come and work. It's more of a consistent heat inside of it. So I think for us, it's how do you use that insight and how do you provide it to people? And one of the things that we look at is uh, how do you provide actually kind of like a nudge theory concept? So just trying to find little pieces of information that you can push to be it people, tenants in homes or uh, people inside the offices of insights that they can actually understand where a small change over a period of time can actually have a big impact. And I think that our challenge is how well we can do that will be a fundamental factor on, on our ability to reach some of those targets. If we can't get that behavioural change in people and they don't understand it from the data and insight that we're providing, we've probably failed in what it is that we're trying to achieve. Mm. Yeah, how do you take that message from you guys in IT, you know, you get this stuff or down to the sort of, I'm going to say frontline staff, you know, the, the construction workers and, and all that sort of stuff? Um, I think some of it is around the channels that you use and some of it is a mix of using our data science teams and our, our communication engagement teams to then craft that message. So I think the data science teams can then you know, trawl over the last large volumes of data, they can look for trends, they can look for patterns. And then with the help of our communications teams, we can actually put that into real world language. 
and actually kind of then come up with some suggestions that we can put in place. The, the data science team then can monitor that to see if we actually started to get the outcomes and did people kind of pick up on those things. In terms of channels as well, in, in, in housing, we have a thing called the Home Health app, which is all around the health of your home, where you can see all of both your descriptive data, the, how hot, how cold it is. But that's also the channel that we're pushing these little nudge insights through about things that maybe you can consider doing. When we see humidity is kind of then rising inside of the bathroom and it's not going down, it's, it's a, the insight is just a little check really then for the homeowner just to make sure the extractor fan is properly working and it's kind of doing what it needs to do. Or if we start seeing spikes in energy usage in a home, just to kind of trigger in so that someone can actually then maybe make a correlation between something else that's going on. Maybe that, that will give you an insight into maybe your uh, your oven isn't as efficient as it, as it maybe needs to be. And maybe the next time you're doing a replacement, you need to definitely go for an A-rated uh, oven and you can maybe start to see the, the impacts on your overall energy bill. Yeah, yeah, wow. Um, really interesting subject, isn't it? Um, what, what's the future for data and analytics in tackling sustainability issues? And what impact does a near real-time analytics capability have on tackling those issues? I think it's only going to grow. And that comes back to if you can measure it, you can do something about it type philosophy. I, I think the closer you can get to near real-time, the more you can influence behaviours and change the way things are working. And and if you look at some of the new technologies that will be coming into office spaces and our homes, that ability for that home to be managing your heating system based on your presence. Um, maybe one day you'll have a Tesla power bank and you know that's storing energy and efficiency and then pulling energy down from the grid at, uh, at 12 o'clock at night or something like that. <laughs> the real time nature of monitoring and managing that sort of infrastructure becomes really critical. You can't do that off a a batch or a lag type basis. So it's only going to, like most things in our lives, it only ever gets faster. And they need to have that data in a, in a real time basis to allow us to deliver insights and monitor and manage things. It is only going to get more extreme. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are we going to get to the point where we're sticking alarms on toasters and kettles and cookers and stuff like that? So they ping us and we, we know where. Uh what we're doing. <laughs> There's some smart guys out there that think they can kind of just drop us off the electrical usage. I think they can pick up on the, the way that that device is pulling um, its energy to dictate what type of device is it and to identify that in people's homes. So there's some, there's some amazing stuff that's going on out there and we just need to latch on to that and integrate that into the projects and the tools that we're doing. Yeah. Do you think generally things need to be regulated more like home appliances i understand that they're obviously regulated already does that regulation have to be sort of taken up a couple of levels i think like in a lot of things in our lives there's a bit of carrot and stick that goes along with this so yes they can be potentially more regulated but there's also providing the incentives and providing the information for people to make those right decisions and it's quite interesting. You could you could say I've got a smart meter um, uh, in my home, and I've also got our platform deployed in, in my home. My smart meter probably just tells me I'm using too much energy all the time. It sits there on the corner, just basically going, "Oh, you've gone over the budget, Phil. You've gone over the budget." <laughs> but it doesn't really correlate back to what caused that and what are the assets that I have in my home that are actually driving that. And that's a bit of the example around. I can see from my data we're on a Sunday and we've got the Sunday dinner going and the and the ovens going or or we come home from holiday and the washing machine and the tumble dryer is going on. I mean, if you can get greater correlation to the energy usage of those, even I myself would probably take greater level of interest in what the energy efficiency level is of that, of that appliance that I'm buying and understand the benefit that I'm getting out of it. I know I probably do need to buy a grade A appliance washing machine. Yeah. Um, I just think I, I, maybe me, maybe like other people, I just maybe need to see the benefits and outcomes of doing that more clearly than I can maybe do today. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Is there a, I mean, we're talking about IoT and sensors and stuff like that. And obviously they're absolutely critical to this, but is there, are there privacy issues? Because I know that's going to be the first thing on people's mind is, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to connect every single thing in my home to the internet because, you know, big brother's watching. I think most definitely, and if you let's kind of focus on one of our sectors around uh, a local authority who's putting sensors into uh, a resident's property, it's even more acute in that, that area. Um, 
the, in our team, we actually have a privacy analyst team who are specifically looking at this and around data protection. Uh, the privacy laws around IoT devices and usage of data in that way uh, are nowhere near as advanced as they are around, for example, usage of data through uh, retail marketing type programs, and they are yeah. they are emerging. Um, there are those some key standards around out there, and some of it is based on legal requirement. So in the UK, for example, there's a thing called the Homes and Habitation Act, which puts a legal requirement on a landlord to provide a home that's fit for habitation, and that has requirements around overheat and underheat, uh, uh, damp and mould. So things like that create a legal requirement. And if there's a legal requirement on a, landowner, a, land, a landlord or a property owner, then that creates, in some ways, um, at least a basis, legal basis for capturing and managing that data. Whereas, for example, your energy data is personal data, and there's a specific consent process that you have to go through to be able to access, access that data. So I think these are emerging. And uh, they are really critical. But one of the, things, the key things for us is about making sure people understand what we're using the data for, how we're using it, and that's really open and transparent. And if we do need permission, there's a clear consent mechanism for them giving it, but also actually removing that consent at any point when they want to. I think a lot of this comes down to us engaging and explaining to people. We probably all sign up for our Alexas and Amazons and kind of then unintentionally agree to do all sorts of things that we probably didn't agree to. And one of the things that we want to be is a lot more transparent about that and be very specific about what we're doing, what we are capturing, and provide those ability for people to truly manage their privacy rights uh, and bring that all together. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Be, uh, I guess, an, a crucial couple of years um, from this point to how that evolves. Um... Yeah, I think there's changes going on in our country and the ICOs we've come out of out of Europe, you'll see some divergence. There's lots of discussion about uh, uh, how the GDPR rules will, will evolve and change over the coming years. And I think there'll be more focus around this IoT connected world and how that information is accessed. And I think anything that is really accessing presence or can give in, in indications of individuals' behavior or you know, significant insights, there's gonna be challenges around how that data is being managed and specifically shared. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I know a certain tele program that might be uh, interested in uh, keeping mould out of uh, tenants' homes, but yes. um, that's Let's another conversation. Never on that. Brilliant. Um, so I know part of the the Golden Eye sort of initiative um, was to, to build or be part of a data trust. What is a data trust, and what benefits does it have on sustainability, environmental? issues and, and us as members of the general public? Yeah, we think this will be a, a growing area actually in, inside of the sector over the coming years. So uh, for us, a data trust is uh, an individual who's, or an organisation that's custodian of data that then allows that data to kind of be then shared for the kind of greater good, um, but while making sure that it's anonymised where it needs to be, it's controlled and it's kind of managed. Um, there's one that's actually going on uh, the London data store uh, where the London boroughs are getting together uh, and uh, we sit here and they're sharing information and data uh, around the communities and the environment that they're, uh, they're providing services in. And that ability to share data, and it might be around the energy efficiency data, and then be able to permit, compare that data with other equivalent data sets, um, I think will be quite powerful. And then to make that data available to other organisations in a controlled and managed way who may be then tackling some of the challenges around climate change to help them inform products or services that they can actually bring into market, as well as for not-for-profit organisations and charities that are kind of working in that. It's really going to be a key, a key area, I think, in allowing that data to be, be shared in a safe way. So I think that, that London data store is definitely one to watch. Um, I think Milton Keynes also has done something around their smart city piece where they have the ability for information to be data be provided and they anonymize it and then other people can then have access to that and use that to help inform their decisions. So I think we'll see more of these sorts of projects hopefully over the next few years. Um, I think they'll help to make sure data is shared and used um, in a safe way to actually inform wider decisions. Yeah, interesting. Could potentially drive that change in legislation you were talking about before and and you know make that more common more robust as well yeah. as delivering the message down 
delivering the message down to the people. Yeah, and again, it comes back to that. If you've got some information, you can do something about it. I think it's then just about how you can then provide it to people. And I think the more that you can safely aggregate and join data out unintentionally creating a GDPR issue by joining the data, I think there's a lot of power inside of that. And it's definitely something that we're interested in and, and talking with the London Data Store about how we could actually work inside of that, how we could be providing energy data or information from the properties that we've got under our management. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the smart cities thing's really important, isn't it? I guess you're looking at buildings and the fabric of buildings, but actually there's a fabric of an entire city which is reliant on energy. Um, so that, that could be another interesting one to, to watch as obviously more and more of the smart cities implementations go ahead. Yeah, and a lot of those, uh, it's maybe like a lot of things that get talked about for a bit and I think they now are becoming a reality. We, we see it from a lot of the clients. It, where, it, where we're working with local authorities that they may have declared a client emergency, they, they'll have a smart city uh, team that's coming and working on some of these activities now that they're trying to tackle some of these issues around you know car charging facilities in inner London now that's all going to hang together um, they're looking at things like uh, heating systems there's people looking to take some of the uh, the heat out of the tubes turn that then into uh, supporting heat pumps and then turning that into kind of an energy so there's there's lots of really interesting projects that's going on there. And I think a lot of those are turning into reality now and actually getting implemented. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess technology and availability of data as well as a big part to play in that, you know, you can't, the idea is there, but being able to actually, you know, execute on it is uh, something yeah. else. I mean, that's one of the things that I've noticed over the last few years that those technology platforms, whether it's like us, we're, we're a Microsoft Azure centric organization or you're AWS focused in your life. Um, I think, you know, from, from data insight and IoT, that ability to, for us, to, in our technical terms, stand up a law and network, integrate it with, you know, IoT hub, get a stream analytics and get, and get a warm data feed of near real time data coming out from homes dotted around the UK um, is not the technological challenge it once used to be. I mean, the mm. challenge now is what do you do with that data and how do you use it and how do you actually drive those behaviours and make the right decisions? The bit about actually capturing it all, yes, there's challenges around the security and the scalability and things like that, but it's not the challenge that used to be there, you know, from, from years years previously. And I think those platforms are allowing organisations to really accelerate and mm. like us build teams capable of moving this forward and we're not building it all from scratch. It's all about integrating components that exist today together in a way that creates a unique product uh, rather than actually trying to create all those products from scratch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all using we're all using electricity, we're all using gas, we're all running water. So it's all there, isn't it? It's just, uh, like you say, getting it right, getting the right components to, to do what you need to do with it. Excellent. Um, so all of your initiatives send a really clear message that you're committed to helping the UK reach the net zero target by 2030, um, which obviously is absolutely fantastic. But how do you bring all of that together in order to attract the right people to your business to continue to drive the initiatives forward with you know maintaining that authenticity? Um, because obviously, like I said before, you operate in an industry that's always, that's always going to be under the spotlight. For sustainability i think there's an element of, of when people are looking to join us making sure we really articulate that sustainability part of our, our business and also one of the things i really try and do is explain that the ethical piece of our of our business in, in that the, there is a real reason we want to support the communities and and the individuals and the businesses that are in those uh in those areas where we deliver in our service whether it's construction mm -hmm. or it's property services looking after someone's home and, and trying to get those messages across to people that are potentially looking to work for us, I think is actually a, a really critical part. I think the culture of the organisation and the Morgan Sindel values sit at the heart of that, of, of how we can articulate to people. And we, we have uh, an element of a devolved philosophy inside the organisation, which empowers people as well to take some of this and take ownership and responsibility and not assume that there's some, some fictitious group somewhere that's just doing all this for you. It's up to us. It's up to us. As, as individuals and colleagues inside of this business, you know, uh, we, we're given that ability to, to make those changes and, 
and make suggestions and also then actually work with directly, I think, with those communities where we're delivering service. I mean, that for some of the new people that have joined us to actually see directly how the projects that they're working on affect the lives of, of, of individuals in society and how, you know, by helping, helping to insulate that home, helping to do that, actually you see individuals coming out of fuel poverty, um, moving from potentially costly heating systems into ones that actually allow them to, to do more, get more out of their home, but also then to do more in their lives. The more we can bring that and actually show the reality of that, I think that makes it quite powerful. And I hope and, and believe that will actually encourage people to come to organisations like ourselves where we can show how real it is. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we focus kind of purely on the sustainability stuff, but that's not just what this does. This It's helping vulnerable people. It's doing all that sort of stuff as well, isn't it? Yeah, you kind of get... You, don't, don't ever kind of lose sight of that. We talk about uh, net zero and we'll talk about energy efficiency and people talk about trying to move from uh, EPC certificates our, our, the way our homes are uh, graded from like Ds to Es to or Cs and upwards. But never forget there's a person that's living inside of those properties or individual like us in offices who may be in fuel poverty, who may have a, a heating system that is less than efficient. The more that we do around that and the more we move them on to energy, efficient energy solutions, the better. But we do need to be careful on that. You can get overly gung-ho and think you're going to move someone from uh, natural gas to electricity. And electricity is three or four times more expensive than natural gas. So you've got to be careful about how you actually do this. But don't ever forget there's a, there's a person, uh, there's, a, there's a family inside of that property um, and there's direct impacts to them and their uh, and and their well-being that is associated with this, um, it's yeah. not. There are some real positive outcomes that will come from this that will allow people to get the most out of their lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, brilliant. Thank you, Phil. Okay, that brings us to a close. Um, absolute pleasure chatting. Uh, yeah, very right. hot, very hot topic, very hot topic, and um, it's nice to be able to communicate the role that data technology and analytics plays in it. Um, uh, for the audience, if you would like to find out more about the GoldenEye platform, you can visit goldeneye.com. That is G-O-L-D-E-N-I.com. Um, and you can also check out KDL's recent white paper uh, on the impact of sustainability to talent acquisition. Um, but yeah, Phil, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark.